Hello, and welcome to the Interactive Age. My name is Paul Schumann, and to my right is my colleagues Donna Presswood and Barbara Benjamin, and we're here to be your hosts on the topic of leadership in the interactive age. And today's topic is integrating technologies in the age of interaction. This is the fourth in the series of programs on leadership in the interactive age. In the previous sessions, we have gone through the topics of leadership and technology. Is your mental map ready? In which we began to talk about how technology is affecting the way in which we think, work, live, and perceive our worlds. In the second session, we talked about personal ingenuity and emerging technologies, bringing up the subject of ingenuity as a new concept of an old idea and how that's related to technologies. In the third session, we talked about knowledge and the ethics of technology in which we describe how important it is to understand what your purpose is and what your organization's purpose is in the choice and uses of technology. In that session, we talked about knowledge and continual change, shifting perspectives of work, technology and purpose, and ingenuity and personal growth. And Barbara, we ended the session with a discussion of our purpose and what are we here for? Yes, as we summarized our program, uh, we realized that we've relinquished a lot of our tasks to technology. And therefore, we have to say, well, if we're not doing those tasks, what are we doing? Well, some of the things we're doing is utilizing technology to expand our capabilities. And we are increasing our tolerance for the risk and uncertainty that is around us when we step beyond what we normally are doing and expand our expectations of what is possible. And we are here to reclaim the power of our ingenuity to know, to be, and create, and to build community. I talked about our purpose with Ginny, uh, Ginny Silver, and Ginny Silver is the uh, manager of development for the technical professionals at International Paper. She started at International Paper as a bench chemist and moved through several of her own unexpected possibilities and became um, a trainer for, for development. And I asked Ginny, um, how important is it for us to open up our tolerance for risk and expand our sense of what is possible and live in what I call the scary region of life? And this is what Ginny told me. Yes, and what happens once you accept that scary area and you step into it, amazing things start to happen and connections and interactions and growth. It just accelerates. You don't have to work at it. It takes you with it. In today's session, uh, we're going to be talking about integrating technologies in the age of interaction. The purpose of this particular session is to enable you to have to better perceive information technology as your teammate. And you will learn how to use and improve uh, these technologies in teamwork and creativity and to lift communication to the level of conversation. I had the chance to talk with uh, Jan Brown recently, and one of the questions I was able to ask Jan is what, for technical professionals in particular, what's needed most of all in this age of interaction? And Jan's comments I think you'll find to be most interesting. Yeah, so the other piece that um, I wouldn't necessarily call high tech, but that's definitely used is um, the ability to communicate on a one-on-one -on -one level and human interaction. And we kind of lose that sometimes when we think about um, the electronic world that we live in. And even, even going back to what I was saying about um, the distributed office that, that exists on five continents and multiple places within those continents, all people working together on the same team to solve a problem. In a sense, that's being to done, done today in science. I mean, scientists worldwide talk to each other all the time. The question is, are they all working for the same corporation? Or are they all working, they may all be working on the same technical problem, but working in different corporations or, or for different governments. Um, what's the piece that binds them, that lets them talk to each other and be willing to talk to each other, 
now that the means are able for them to do that on a daily basis. It's trust. It's understanding and valuing the, the individual. So there's a huge level of human communications that, that is also very, very important to um, how I do my work that I wouldn't necessarily call technology. But we're not taught very well how to deal with it. Certainly our educational system doesn't do it. I mean, if you're studying to be a scientist or an engineer, the important thing is the core curriculum, the um, um, your coursework and, and, and depth in your field. Mm -hmm. And very little of that work is done in teams, although they're now starting to do that a little bit in universities to have some team projects. But you can opt not to do that. You can opt to do something singly by yourself instead of working in a team. So it's still the idea of the lone scientist That's in right. his or her laboratory That's right. but, producing that answer. To. But when you get in the real world, it's not like that at all. You have to work together with other people. And that's a piece that we don't teach. And I think that that's a piece that's going to become even more important if we're going to um, if we're going to survive as a society. And I know that sounds like a real strong <laughs> statement, mm -hmm. but I really believe that because if you just have these 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 moles, if you will, these lone scientists or or engineers or individual anywhere in society, but let's take the scientist and engineer working just by themselves from their home, um, where's the connect? Where's, where's the fabric of socialization? I mean, I think it'll fall apart. People need that human interaction. And I think that we need to um, help people do that. You know, the early, the early office at home mm -hmm. piece, that when, when some companies did that, they found that within, what, three to six weeks, people were spending, the first week it was like five days at home, then the next week it was maybe four days at home, and by the end of six weeks they were back in the office more than half time because they wanted the, the, they interaction, the interaction with other people. And they, they found that the motivations coming out of the home were, were difficult to... Uh... Right, when they were just connected by a computer or a telephone. Well, in the interactive age, you can sit at home now and you can see people. I mean, you can turn on your PC and you can talk to your colleague in France or you can talk to your colleague down the street. And, and so um, that communication piece and actually being able to talk to them real time face to face is going to be there. And people are going to be sitting off at home instead of in a physical workplace, but they're going to have that face to face interaction with all these people and be able to work on problems that way. And I think that the skills, the, the human skills of being able to interact are going to be real, real important. And we don't teach that. You're watching Sleepcore, Pleasant Dreams. Staying in touch, no matter where you are. A commitment to world-class communications design. A tradition of excellence built on uncompromised performance and reliability. Meeting the demands of everyday use and sometimes accidental abuse makes Motorola your best choice in cellular communications. For most of us, learning to do even the simplest task is made easier if we see it demonstrated first. So, for the next 10 minutes, we'll show you what you need to know for daily phone use. Now, let's get ready to use your phone. Press power whenever you want to turn your phone on or off. As the phone powers up, it performs a split-second system check to ensure it's working properly.
If your phone is locked, this is the first message you'll see. Your phone is programmed to unlock by pressing one, two, three. If your salesperson changed the code to a number of your choice, enter it instead. If you make a mistake, press clear and start again. When the green light appears, your phone is on. The signal strength meter will always appear whenever your phone is on and unlocked. If the display disappears, don't worry, battery power is preserved when your phone is not in use. Just press clear to recall the display. Of course, if you receive a call, the display will relight automatically. Just press send to answer. Before placing or receiving a call, power must be on, the phone unlocked, and the no service indicator off. If no service appears, you're either outside your cellular phone company's service area or inside a structure blocking the signal. Just remember, no service must be off to use your phone. To place a call, enter the telephone number. If you miss dial, press clear and dial again. To start calling, press send. If you hear this, it may mean the service system is full and can't handle your call immediately. If this happens, press send again. Your phone will attempt to complete the connection by automatically redialing the number. If redial is successful, a ring alert will sound once. Just listen for your party to answer. You don't need to press send. Hi. If it's not, cancel at any time by pressing end. Once your call is in progress, in use will appear. If roam appears, your call is being carried by another cellular phone company. This is normal when you're traveling. But if roam stays on, even in your home service area, see your user's manual to reset your phone's system selection. And of course, when your call is finished, make sure you press end to cancel the connection. Receiving a call is almost identical to placing a call. Again, power must be on, the phone must be unlocked, and no service must be off. When the phone rings, press send to answer. And when your call is through, press end again to cancel the connection. When you're done using your phone, or must leave it unattended, secure it from unauthorized use by locking it. To lock your phone, just press function 5. After six seconds, your phone will shut off automatically. Yes. Uh, Adjusting uh, volume you, levels can add to your comfort sound. and convenience. To raise or lower the volume you hear in the earpiece, press and hold the volume button until you hear the level you want. To change loudness direction, Release the button and then press and hold as before. The volume meter will let you see, as well as hear, the highest and lowest settings available. You can also adjust the phone's ringer to receive incoming calls. Just press function and then press and hold the volume button as before. Your phone is designed to dial your local emergency number with one button speed and convenience, even if your phone is locked. To use emergency dialing, just program the first memory location by entering your local emergency phone number, then press store and enter the two-digit location number. Now, whenever you need to call for help, just press and hold memory key one. Your call will be dialed automatically. You don't need to press send. Every time you place or receive a call, the signal strength meter lets you know if you're in a strong or weak reception area. Simply put, the more bars that appear, the stronger the signal and the clearer your reception. Anytime you want a quick reference check of your own cellular phone number, you can call it up by pressing recall and pound. 
to cancel the display, just press clear again. Your phone is compatible with a variety of optional battery packs, as well as charging units for at-home and in-car use. By pressing function 4, you can call up the battery voltage meter to see whether your battery is fully charged or ready for recharging. As your battery power gets lower, you'll see this message on the display. And when it's almost completely discharged, you'll hear this warning. While we've shown you the basics of daily phone use, there are a variety of features which haven't been demonstrated here. Please read your owner's manual carefully to make sure you get the most out of your new cellular phone. If you need further assistance or wish to offer suggestions about additional features you'd like to see demonstrated on video, please call the Cellular Information Center. Yes, I can walk you through that operation right now. Motorola accessories are designed for performance-matched compatibility with your cellular phone. So even if your phone looks different from our demonstration model, don't worry, every accessory will be a perfect fit. Because you never know exactly when you'll need it, an extra battery is a sensible addition to any portable phone. The non-rechargeable alkaline battery pack is perfect for short-term operation. Just insert the six AA batteries included and your phone is ready to use. For long life operation, Motorola quality and reliability are built into every rechargeable battery, including high capacity models for extended talk time. For frequent phone use in your car, just switch to the travel battery saver. Your car's battery supplies all the power you need, while your phone battery stays ready for portable use. Motorola performance matched accessories are available from your local cellular phone retailer. Of course, if your store doesn't have the right Motorola accessory in stock, just call our toll free parts and accessories number and ask for Operator 99. A Motorola specialist is ready to take your order for immediate home delivery. You're watching Sleepcore, media for insomnia. By now, we all know that websites for political candidates have become a critical ingredient to anyone hoping to get elected. And the Super Bowl of campaign websites, of course, is the battle for the presidency. Here to help us figure out who's doing it right and who's doing it wrong is Lindsay Arendt, a writer for Wired News who's written extensively on the online efforts of the presidential candidates. Hi, Lindsay. Hi. All right, we have a bunch of them here. Let's start with John McCain. That's the classic story of raising a lot of money on the web. Anyhow, do you think that's a good website? Yeah, John McCain's done a great job. It's a scrappy website. It's very it's streamlined. What does scrappy not, mean? Scrappy means they put it up, they have young people running it, and it's not. it doesn't have too many bells and whistles. It's not crowded or cluttered, but it gets the job done. Okay. Um, he's got things like instantly when you get on, you have a cookie come up asking you to give them money. He's got okay. an extensive... So they know what the web is about, these guys. Definitely, definitely. And they have a, an extensive group of people who are volunteers who are running the websites who are doing a great job in the individual right. state. Now they use email pretty cleverly here too, right? Once they very get you? Very much, very much. They're you get every emails day? every single day, at least once or All twice right. a day. And he did a cool fundraising thing, right? If you wanted to chat live with John McCain, you paid so much for it? Right. It's actually a pay-per-view kind of thing with a candidate <laughs> that I've never seen before, where you actually, you pay a hundred bucks or more, you get to chat live, like right. you were saying with John McCain, and I, I don't know how much money he got out of it, but it was a great idea. Pretty clever. Now let's go to Steve Forbes. He's out of it, obviously, but he did a pretty darn good website, didn't he? Yeah, he has all the bells and whistles. He has his commercials at the bottom. He's got all these little things, these icons everywhere, these e-precincts, which are supposed to be this big what deal. What is e-precincts? It's where everybody in different geographic locations are sort of separated via the web, and they get together in their areas All right, via so email. gather your little support groups in each of the communities. You need them when he's about to show up in town or whatever. Exactly, exactly. But to me, the website, even though it has all of this fancy stuff, doesn't really do it for me. I mean, it's very crowded. There's a lot to look at. You don't really want to go through that, and there's no direct message at you right yeah, away. Yeah, kind of too corporate in a way. I mean, not, not the scrappiness you were talking about in yeah, between there. Yeah, exactly. didn't, didn't do much good, obviously. Well, obviously Spend not. Spent a fortune. Yeah. All right, let's try another example. Gary Bauer, here's another failed 
uh, candidate, and yeah. you think his website was pretty lousy, I see. Yeah, I kind of do. I think it's pretty cheap looking, and they obviously didn't put a lot of effort into their web effort as in part of the campaign. You look at this good news thing, here it is with late February, and this is left A little bit out of date, six, seven weeks. Yeah, it's back from the... Well, maybe I they haven't had good news in a long time. <laughs> exactly, and actually talking to the people in the campaign, they don't really know what's going to happen with the website. They haven't made any plans to take it down, to update it. They just yeah. kind of think, oh, we'll just leave it the way it is, which shows they don't care that All much right. about Let's it. Let's go to George W. Bush next. Uh, okay. Ton of money, supposedly sophisticated campaign, but a lot of problems with his website, right? Yeah, yeah. This is a website that looks pretty good. They did have to overhaul it once or twice. It was originally run by all volunteers. And George W. Bush did not show that he was very net savvy when he tried to uh, shut down this website, this parody site, gwbush.com. He tried to go to the FEC, the so federal... So these guys put up GW Bush to make fun of him. Exactly. And like he didn't like know the web culture, let it be. Right, he tried to make a big stink about it, and basically that's an yeah. assault on people's privacy. Everybody was up in arms about it, and he showed that he, he didn't did know a, much. He did another kind of dumb thing on his website, too, instead of you know posting the, the contributors list in PDF formats and nobody could really see it. Exactly, that was also a big gap. I mean, he's shown that he really isn't an Internet site kind of candidate. I mean, I think he's yeah. alienated a lot of young people that way. All right, let's go to the Dems for a minute and uh, take a look at Bradley and Gore. And what do you think of the Bradley site? I like Bradley's Pretty site nice, from yeah. the beginning. I mean, from the very beginning, he was always up there with a good web presence. He always had photos. Every event that he went to, they would put photos up. They had this biography. It's just very clean. A little map there so you can check on where you're from and see what's going on. Do, does it matter, you think, other than the fact that we like it? I mean, is there, enough, is there a consequence to a good website, a bad site? I don't know. I think the good, clean websites that aren't too cluttered, that have a direct message, usually do pretty well. I mean, Bradley yeah. has raised quite a bit of money online. Got it. He's done pretty well, and so has John McCain. So maybe there's a correlation. Yeah. Maybe. What about Al Gore's site? Al Gore's also a pretty good site. Um, let's see what it looks like here. They also have, you know, they have some bells and whistles. They have a, a cursor that morphs into a comment when you sort of download it. Uh -huh. They have a kids section. You know, What's the point in the kids section? Getting them young, try to get them into the party when they're young. <laughs> All you right, like, so, like, like, yeah. like selling Hershey bars. I, I find that it's slightly boring. You know, I don't know. It's not so different. Than yeah, it doesn't ones. look real exciting visually. That's for sure. Just watching the commercials. You know, okay. Pretty simple. Now, what's interesting, and we talked about this a bit before earlier in the show, is anybody can put up "I'm running for president" website, right? Right. And you've got a lot of real wacko websites up there, and I think right. you have one good example: Fig Bar Man for President. Exactly. What is this about? It's just some random person who wants to make a statement, put a website up. It's easy enough. That's what the net's all about. Right. I mean, you have Admiral Akbar, which is a cartoon alien for president. You have random people running for president all over the internet. It doesn't mean anything, but it's for fun. Just jokes. Yeah. So on the web, anybody can run for president. Anything guess, goes. Huh? You can never yeah. tell. Thanks a lot, Lindsay. Sure. If the gamblers of the world are going to play in cyberspace big time, they're going to have to find a system where they can exchange money the same way they do in real casinos. Except they're going to have to do it with some form of electronic cash. Digital money isn't new. The big world banks transfer trillions among themselves every day without ever actually touching a real dollar. But until now, that technology hasn't been available to the rest of us. Making it available has been the life's work of cryptographer and internet visionary, David Chom. Mr. Chom lives and works in Amsterdam and in cyberspace and has been developing a system called eCash. eCash is really very, very close to the uh, cyberspace equivalent of an automatic teller machine. You, you go there, you withdraw cash, you use the cash for whatever you want, you may get some other cash, and occasionally you can also go there and deposit cash. David Chom is a bit of a legend in the wired community. He's been preaching his electronic cash concept for nearly 15 years and sees it as a whole new way of looking at money, a new digital currency. eCash is based on taking real money to buy digital cash electronic tokens for shopping on the internet. While most financial systems already on the net rely on credit cards in some way or other, eCash is a revolutionary form of personal money. It would still be issued and guaranteed by the major banks. And like the real thing, once you'd spent it, there would be no trace of who it came from or what it was spent on. No paper or electronic trail. Not only has he developed a new currency, David Chom has taken a stance against the ubiquitous information gatherers. What you really have is the, uh, the this tremendous momentum towards very fine-grained uh, data capture about individuals, not for any real malicious, uh, sinister reason, but uh, just sort of uh, in the interest of uh, efficiency and uh, uh, and nor normal commercial interests, but you're, you're creating something which is, poses an extreme 
well, I would sometimes they say national vulnerability, but it's, it's, I think it's, it's, it's broader than that. It, 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 it's something that, it's like uh, building some kind of uh, very dangerous system that uh, if someone could get in there and, and grab that data and, and misuse it, um, you, you would have a very different world than, than you have today. And just, just people just knowing that what they're doing is being uh, watched and recorded in great detail has an enormously chilling effect on them. If you think all this talk about data gathering and new currencies is just futuristic nonsense and will never happen, David Chalm just asks you to cast your mind back to the introduction of credit cards. I mean, 25 years ago, credit cards were basically uh, going through, I think, a five to seven year period of, of just repeated uh, trials and failures. And uh, it was a nightmare, and the, and the technical infrastructure was such that, you know, banks had to send their, their receipts to the other banks in the system, and so uh, it was unbelievably cumbersome, and some banks just refused to pay the other banks and, and, uh, and so forth, and there were tremendous problems with fraud, and there was a lot of concern about extending consumer credit, and, and organized crime was involved in a big way in stealing cards and this and that. I mean, it was a, it's an incredible history if you read about it, but after, so after these five or seven years, finally it kind of settled down, and by now people regard credit cards to be, uh, you know, as basic as, uh, you know, as, as anything else. If credit cards are no longer a novelty, personal electronic commerce still is. Various governments have been eyeing the whole phenomenon with great caution, worried about both the speed and the anonymity of untraceable money. The big banks have also been slow to embrace e-cash, but Mr. Chom is convinced the technology has now been perfected, and the entire financial community will have to get its head out of the clouds and actually start treating his concept as a reality. If he's right, e-cash is poised to have a huge effect on business on the internet, and that's welcome news, not only in Amsterdam, but all over cyberspace. The StarTac, the world's most wearable cellular phone. Motorola, what you never thought possible. Don't let the world spin you around. With the new Nokia 7110 in your hand, you have the world at your fingertips. Turn and click to write a message. Use the Navi Roller to select from up to 1,000 names, each with up to five numbers and two rows of text. Life is too short to stand in line. The Nokia 7110 supports World Wide Web, Mobile Media Mode, an open standard which connects to services and text information on the internet. Book tickets, check timetables, do your banking. Why search when you can find? Join a news service and receive only the news and information that interests you. Real-time stock prices or news about your company. Why be tied to one place? Check your email or have fax headers sent straight to your phone. To make it easier to use all these services, the Nokia 7110 has a huge display, large fonts and predictive text input to make writing much faster. With the built-in dictionary, you can write faster and easier. In the Nokia 7110, the internet meets the cellular network. Global information meets individual freedom. The Nokia 7110 puts the world at your fingertips.